Lord God, thank you for giving us this opportunity to dig into your word tonight. Bless us through it. Uh, grow us closer to you as you promised to do when we study your word. Uh, open our eyes to see more of who you are and what you mean for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so this is Bible information class. There are binders at the table. If you don't have one, you want to grab one. These are yours to keep. So feel free to uh, write notes and big thing, write questions in them. You probably noticed in the front pack, the front pocket, there's a sheet that says my questions that need to be answered. Um, this class is, is going to be very question based. That's what makes it interesting. Uh, what you have in the book is basically an outline with a whole bunch of Bible passages. Um, we're going to be talking about those. And if, if we just read them and I just say my thing, you'll be bored. So um, it's going to be based on your questions where we get to dig in and find God's word answer to it. So I believe that the Bible is God's word. Um, I'll, I'll start with that. I know that not everybody does. Um, you know, there different people come at it from, from different angles. You know, it's, it's just a human book, or I'm not sure. How do I know? That's between you and God. That's a, a faith thing that, you know, God has caused me to believe that it is his word. And the more I study it, the more I'm convinced of that as, as he keeps his word and his word is true. And, and it's a, a wonderful guide for our lives. There are a lot of people that talk about God's word. Um, and a lot of people try to use it for whatever it is they want to say. Um, and just like you can twist someone else's words in an argument, people quite often twist God's word to say something that it, it doesn't. So our goal um, in this is to uh, dig in and find what the Bible says about it, whether you agree with it, whether you like it or not, whether you believe that it's true or not, um, that's going to be your own journey. Uh, my goal in this is to make sure that you know what it is the Bible actually says. Because a lot of people think that the Bible says this or that or, or whatever else um, and haven't ever really dug into it and, and, and looked. And there are some, some passages in the Bible that make you ask a question. Um, our goal, our process, is, is when those questions come up to find where in the Bible God answers those questions. And as we do that, we're going to grow, and I'm going to grow from your questions as it makes me dig in and try to figure out okay, where, does, where does God answer that. Um, so your questions make it really interesting for me, and your questions make it interesting for each other. I've, I've heard so many people tell me, oh, I don't want to ask the question. No one else no one else is worried about that, or you know, it, it's, it's going to be a bother to other people. I can guarantee you it's not. Um, so many times people have said that, and then someone else has said, no, I'm really glad you asked that because it made me think of this and whatever else. So you have that sheet at the front of your book because chances are the questions aren't always going to come up when you're sitting here. When you're sitting here, just stop us and say, hey, what about that? And, and we'll dig into that. Um, I don't get worried if we don't finish a whole lesson in the hour. I will try to end us right at an hour or, you know, a minute or two if, if need be, because I want to respect your time. Um, but we'll just end and we'll pick up the next time. Uh, and in the week in between, as you're thinking about it, as you're talking about it, questions might pop up. Write them down, unless you've got a way better memory than I do. Because I know how many times it's happened where, oh, next time I see Peach, I got to ask her that. Uh, and then when I see Peach, I remember, oh, I got to ask her but I don't remember what it is I was going to ask her, right? So write it down. Every week I'll start by asking if you had any questions that came up during the course of the week. We'll, we'll work on answering those, um, and that'll kind of be the review from what we've talked about, and then we'll get into the new stuff. Make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, you've got, uh, yeah, like I said, the binder is yours. Take your notes. Um, the first thing in is table of contents, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, and then you get to chapter one. And I'll warn you, chapter one might sound really, really basic, but it is absolutely setting the stage for a whole bunch of questions and a whole bunch of things coming up. Because in order to understand how God works and what he does, um, we have to have an honest answer of who God is. So you, you see the, the chapter one is titled Concerning God. You have that question, is there a God? guessing I probably know the answer everybody around this table would give to that, right? But but I'm also guessing that um, 
either there have been times in your life when you weren't so sure about that answer, or maybe you're thinking about that now, or maybe you know someone who's not so sure about that answer. And I can tell you, well, the Bible says there's a God. And if you don't believe that there's a God, that doesn't really answer the question, does it? Because, well, what's the Bible? It's God's word. No, it isn't. Some people wrote it, right? I mean, so so that, that doesn't help a whole lot. Uh, so the first page here, we're going to talk about the, the natural knowledge of God um, or the, uh, the, uh, uh, the ways that God reveals himself to us even outside of the Bible. And then the second half of the lesson, we're going to talk about the things that he says about himself that, that are kind of mind-blowing. Um, they're, they're different than what we're used to. And so as we answer the question coming up, we uh, um, are able to uh, have the basis of what he said he is rather than what I think he should be. Because ultimately, it doesn't matter what I think or what a church teaches or what my grandma always said. Um, those are all nice things, but um, what matters is, is what does God say? Uh, if there is a God, and if he has given us his word, um, let's at least pay attention to what it says, and then we can determine whether whether we think that it is his word or not. Make sense? All right. So is there a God, the natural knowledge of God? Number one, the belief in God is actually logical. Why? So you'll see this kind of outline um, throughout the course. You have a statement and then a whole bunch of passages. Um, it is really easy to take a Bible passage out of context and try to make a point that the passage doesn't make. Um, it happens all the time. I can tell you I'm not going to do that, um, but I want you to, to test me on that. So all of these, um, we could be looking them all up. If you have your own Bible and you want to want to look them up, that, that's great. Sometimes it helps to get the passages around it, the context there. There are a few Bibles on the table if, if you want to do that, but just for the sake of efficiency, and, and um, I've printed out um, the passages here, uh, and I'll try to give you some of the some of the context to them. But again, um, as you go home and you want to dig into this more, look them up and see what it says around them so that you can make sure that what I'm putting here um, is really talking about what I'm saying it's talking about. Uh, and so as we go, just so you don't have to hear me talk too much, because I can already tell by your faces that I'm talking too much. We're gonna we're gonna do the the we're gonna let you guys read the passages, uh, but we do the player pass system um, because God has wired different people differently, and we learn in very different ways. Uh, if you are like me, I'm gonna say probably pass because if someone asks me to read something that I'm not familiar with or I haven't prepared. Um, as I'm reading it, my mind is going, am I reading this right? Is that, how do I pronounce this? How do I pronounce? And I'm not really, I'm not really getting a whole lot out of what's actually being said because I'm so worried about that. Um, but there are other people who learn a whole lot better when they're reading something out loud. Um, so you determine which suits you. And as we go around, we'll do play or pass. And I always start on my left. So, uh, so uh, Deborah, you want to play or pass on Hebrews yeah. three, four? All right. Pastor, can I ask you a question yes. before we get started? I'm so sorry. I'm no, so sorry. Jesus, but, yeah. What version? So, what's in here is NIV. Okay. And actually, it's uh, the 84 version of NIV, just because I haven't gone through Thank it you so and much. updated it. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so great question. Thank you. I'm so, sorry. Thank you. No, absolutely. So we talk about translations. Um, there are a lot of great translations of the Bible, right? Uh, God wrote, God had his people write the Old Testament in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek. Um, not many of us would be able to read that off the page and understand what it's saying, right? Um, so God has also blessed us with people with a whole lot of study and scholarly wisdom to be able to, to translate those. And so um, different translations are aiming for different things. You know, King James, beautiful translation, but it's sometimes hard for people who aren't familiar with it to understand. Um, you know, NIV is is designed for modern ears. Um, and even that, you know, the 2011 translation of the NIV is a little different than, than the 84. Um, and if you've got a, a translation that you like, use it. Um, and if you want to read it alongside what we're doing here, that's great too. And if you have any questions on that, 
ask. So, excellent. Yep. Exactly. All right. So, Hebrews 3 4. Hebrews 3 4. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Okay. So, you walk into this building tonight, and I would be willing to bet money that none of you came in here and looked around and thought, you know what? I know what happened. There used to be some woods here. A tornado came through, whipped up all the woods and picked up some rocks and, and, and threw it all together and out came this building. I'm willing to bet money that none of you thought that as you walked in here. If you thought about the structure at all, you just knew, well, someone planned it, right? You can tell that, that there were probably a lot of people involved in it, right? People who got the materials and people who put it together and, you know, they, they you know, put the drywall on and the paint. And just by looking at it, you can tell that there were people involved. There were builders involved, architects, all of that. Um, the writer to the Hebrews here makes the point, um, if you can tell that about a house, think about what God made, right? God is the builder of everything. Think about the world that we live in. Um, it's not chaos. Uh, it should be, it could be, but uh, we have trees that have fruit on them and the, the fruit feeds us and the fruit has seeds in it that, that you know, the fruit drops and the, the birds eat the seeds and plant them and other trees grow up and the, the, the bees are pollinating the flowers. And I mean, you think about the human body, um, you know, the, uh, the the times that I'm trying to think of my last cut. Um, so right there, I uh, was not, you know, feeling bad or anything, but uh, but I forget what exactly happened. Something, I was putting pressure on something and, and uh, um, it released all at once and I, it was bleeding pretty good right there. Uh, and I, I mean, I cleaned it, but my body fixed itself. Um, that's, you look around and you say, okay, maybe maybe there's something um, that that caused this, that that's making this run. Um, Romans one puts that into specifics. Sabrina, I'll play your pass. Romans one twenty. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities have his internal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood for what has been made so that men are without excuse. Okay. So it says, since the world's been here, two things have been on display. God's eternal power. So in other words, there's there's something bigger than me, right? Uh, and, and divine nature, different than human, right? Um, and he said that that's, that's clear so that we're without excuse, so that we can't say, oh, I didn't know um, that there was something else out there. Uh, Psalm 19, 1, Vicar. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. That's my camping verse. Um, I don't know. We live really close, you know, in city, close to city. You look up, and at night, if it's clear, you can see some stars. Uh, I was out in Yellowstone one night driving at about 3 in the morning and uh, driving my son from <clears throat> Seattle to Minnesota. And uh, we took a little detour and um, I just had to stop and get out of the vehicle and stare for a half hour. Because, you know, when you actually see a sky full of stars, um, there's something that just says, you can only say, wow, right? Or maybe for you, it's, it's uh, looking at the ocean or a mountaintop and, and you just say, wow. Um, that sense that there's something out there. That, that's what the psalmist is talking about here. So much so that Psalm 14 says, the fool says in his heart there is no God. Um, if we say there's not a God, we're fooling ourselves. But there are plenty of people today who would still say, no, that's just how things happened and what we have, right? Um, and so then I'll, I'll usually go to a, a second um, question. And that question is, have you ever felt guilty? And so far, I, no one has answered that no. Um, at one point or another, everybody understands what guilt is. And then the question that follows that is, if, um, if there's nothing above us that we're answering to, why would you feel guilty? 
if you decided to do that, um, then you did that, right? Uh, but the fact that deep down we we know some things um, says that there's something deep down. There's there's something beyond just just us. Uh, Romans two fourteen deals with that one. Pete, you want you want to play or pass? Yep. Yeah. All right. Indeed, the Gentiles do not have the law, be by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves. Even though they do not have the law, if they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences are bearing are also bearing witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even their witness. Okay, kind of a complex, convoluted sentence there. So just kind of walk through it. So this is Paul writing first century AD. Um, and he says, when Gentiles, so for the, the the Jewish people of the time, they saw things very clearly. There were two kinds of people in the world. There were Jews and everyone else. Right? The, everyone else would be the Gentiles. And he says, they, they don't have the law. So, you know, the Jews had the Old Testament. They had the prophets. They had the priests. They had the temple and the tabernacle. They had the, the Ten Commandments. They had all of that. The law, they called it. Um, but he says the Gentiles don't have the law, but yet by nature they're doing the same things. Right? I mean, you think about every different law code, whether Strabo, Hammurabi, wherever, whenever, there are some similarities, right? Mm -hmm. um, you don't steal, you don't murder, you don't kill, you don't, you know, you don't rape, you don't whatever. Um, the fact that everybody knows that, God says, well, that that's because I wrote that in their hearts. Um, he, he put that there and he says our conscience is testified to it right your conscience bears witness if you're doing something wrong um, and no one else knows your conscience tells you or if if you're doing something right and someone else is saying no that's wrong your conscience says no no, no that's right uh, so he says our conscience bears witness how about first john one verse eight did if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Okay. So if I say I'm perfect, you can say, well, you just proved you aren't right there by lying. Um, you know, Romans 3, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Any questions so far? So you think about the natural knowledge, looking at two things. One, this world that we're living in nature, giving us the sense that there's something bigger than me, right? And then the second, our conscience telling us um, we haven't been perfect. So if if I've messed up and there's someone more powerful than me that I've messed up against, that leads to a problem, right? Uh, logic would say, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get punished or I got to do something to fix it. Right, and that's where the natural knowledge leads. Uh, you know, it, it 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 tells us that there's something out there, but it doesn't tell us who that something is or how we fix the problem that's inherent with being less than perfect individuals living in God's perfect world. Um, and so we we flip the page, and it says our natural knowledge isn't sufficient for salvation. There's only one true God. Natural knowledge just tells us that there is a God. Um, Shelby, you want Psalm 96 5? For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Okay. So there were and there still are a lot of different gods and goddesses and, and philosophies and, and ways people think about this. And so, you know, the psalmist, uh, thousand years BC saying uh, you look around and yeah there's there's Baal and Molech and Chemosh and and Ray and all these gods and, and systems of gods and goddesses and he says they're all idols so the the Hebrew word there is hevel um, it's the, the the word picture is is of a mist so you go outside on a cold day and you can see your breath and you know it looks like something but there's really you know nothing behind it right um, he says, that's what those gods are like. Yeah, they've got their temples and their altars and their, their priests and, and priestesses and whatever else. Um, they've got people following them, but there's nothing behind them when you contrast it with the Lord who made everything. So God's word says there's, there's one God. Um, 
And in Acts 17, Betty, I won't make you read that whole thing. I'll uh, I'll take that one. Um, and in fact, I'll I'll kind of just skim some of it. So kind of read through it as, as I'm talking. But this is uh, the Apostle Paul. So um, early Christian missionary. Jesus told him, "I'm going to send you out." Paul listened. He he goes and he tells people about Jesus. He's going from town to town across the the ancient world um, and and starting congregations, telling people about Jesus, gathering them together, appointing leaders, moving on to the next place. Quite often, first time he comes to a place, there are people that listen to him. And then there are other people who say, no, 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 you're not messing with, you know, this person, you know, this God is the God of this area. You get out of here and, and we're going to get you, right? So um, so he's constantly being beaten, arrested, stoned, left for dead, uh, He's in, I think it's Thessalonica, where he's he's preaching and people are listening. But then uh, some some people who had driven him out of the previous city find out he's there. They go there. They're gathering around the house in the middle of the night, waiting for him to come out in the morning. And and Paul jumps out the window and takes off for Athens um, and tells his coworkers, "Hey, when it's clear, come join me in Athens, and we'll we'll get work in there." So while Paul's in Athens, he is uh, well doing what Paul does. He's walking up and down the streets, talking to people. And telling them about Jesus. Um, Athens was a, a hotbed of philosophy. You know, you name any of the ancient philosophers, uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, Athens. Um, and so that was a, a big thing in Athens, talking about the latest philosophies. So Paul's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the resurrection from the dead. Uh, there are people there listening, saying, I've never heard anything like that, and I know all the different philosophies, right? So, so they say, hey, Paul, um, why don't you come to our meeting of the Areopagus? That's where the philosophers gathered and talked their talk. Um, and they said, yeah, you know, tell us your philosophy, and we'll tell you whether you're crazy or not, right? So, so Paul comes to the meeting of the Areopagus, and this is, I'll pick up in verse 22, so about two-thirds of the way down. It says, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. So um, even today, uh, you know, archaeology and even what's still standing testifies that the people of Athens of that day were very religious. There were temples and monuments and altars and and uh, active worship life for all sorts of different gods. Um, you know, the the god of war, goddess of fertility, god. You know, and and he says, I see that you're very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So think about what that was saying. Why did they have all of these gods and goddesses and altars and temples? Well, it's because the natural knowledge had told them there's something. Life doesn't always go like we think it should go, right? You know, two families are trying to have kids. One of them has no problem, child after child. The other one doesn't. What could be the cause? Well, the gods, right? So maybe if we if we offer a sacrifice or give something to the god of fertility or the goddess of fertility, then then we'll be able to have a kid. So they do that. Or, or two nations go into go into war, and one seems to have all the advantages, but the other one wins. Why? Uh, must be the gods. So if we please the god of war and we build a, a temple and sacrifice things, then then maybe it'll be and just that repeated itself. For every different aspect of life, you need the God of the harvest and whatever else. And they even have one to an unknown God. In other words, in case we miss something, um, we want to cover our bases. And Paul says, now when you worship as something unknown, I'm going to proclaim to you. By the natural knowledge, all we can do is guess at, at who or what God is. And Paul says, it's got to be revealed to you. Um, and of course, he was bringing God's word and, and the message of Christ and, and you know, building it on the Old Testament that God had already given to his people. Um, but that natural knowledge, it, it doesn't give us the answer, but it does make us ask the question. That's what number two says. The purpose of the natural knowledge is that it leads us to seek for God. Betty, you want to play your pass on X 17? Yeah. You'll pass? Gary, you want to play your pass? Oh, I'll, I'll play. All right. Okay. For one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. 
47. Is that right? Yeah, that's just the verse number. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. So he is not far from each one of us. Okay. So oh, yeah, God determined the times and the exact places where where people live. Think about think about your journey to this room today. Where you said, you know what, I want to study the Bible. And you ended up here in this room. I'm trying to think, did anyone here that didn't come with the other person know anyone else here before starting to study the Bible together? I mean, how random is that, right? And you think of all the different things that happened. Uh, maybe it was, you know, as a, as a child, you learned something and then, and then a couple things happened in life recently where you said, you know what, I want to get back to that. Or, or maybe someone that you met invited you or you got into a conversation or something bad happened in your life and you said, you know what, um, I, I got to figure this out. Whatever it is, probably a thousand different little things to, to bring us all together tonight to be looking to God's word for answers. Notice God is sitting here saying, yeah, I did that, right? Um, you know, he, he, he did it so that we're looking for him. And he says he's not far from each one of us. You know, his, his message is right here. Um, number three says the natural knowledge by itself only leads to two outcomes. Either we live lives of sacrifice and good works, trying to, you know, have I done enough? I got to do enough. And, you know, kind of spin in that, that hamster wheel. Or... They try to say, you know what, I just don't want to think about it. Um, and, and we'll say there, there isn't a God. Um, but only the Bible gives us the knowledge necessary for salvation. Let's read John 3, 16. And Tanetta, you want to play our passage? Yeah, I can eat. Okay. Them. For God so loved the world that he gave him one and only son. That Excuse me. whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, that doesn't make sense. God, right? If if God, if there's a God, if God is God and He's all powerful and He made the world, when the world rebelled against Him, you know, He said, "Don't eat from that tree," and they said, "Yes," and He said, "Be perfect," and we said, "No." When the world rebelled against Him, you would think logic, sense would say, "Okay, so God's going to punish," um, but. Instead, God so loved the world that he sacrificed. You would think we would have to sacrifice. But the answer is that he sacrificed. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him doesn't perish, but has eternal life. Um, and that transitions us then to the, the revealed knowledge. So what God has told us about himself in his word, that's the, the rest of, the, the, of tonight. Um, any questions, comments? Holes in the in the uh, in the thought process. Um, all right. Then we get to eleven attributes of God. Eleven things that God says about Himself. And as we go through these, we're going to notice more and more that uh, it's not like us. Um, we are used to things a certain way, and God is totally other than that. We start with God is a spirit. All of us have physical bodies, right? We're used to things that we can touch and taste and feel and see and hear. God isn't that. He's not bound by space. Uh, he, 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 he can take physical forms. And in the Bible, we hear about him appearing in one way or another. Uh, but his essence, God is spirit. John 4, God is spirit. His worshipers worship in spirit and in truth. Um, number two, God is eternal. Uh, Bridget, you want to play your pass on Psalm 90? Okay. Psalm 91 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world for everlasting and to everlasting. You are God. Okay. You know, before the mountains were born, before the world was here. God is. We're used to things with starts and finishes. 
we're used to timelines. We, are, we have to wait till tomorrow to see what tomorrow will bring, right? God is not that. He's eternal from everlasting to everlasting he is. And yeah, I think I can kind of comprehend eternity going forward, right? Just never ends. You've probably been in situations where it seems like, you know, this is just never ending. But so, but when I start, start trying to think about eternity going backwards, um, my mind just kind of blows up, right? So, well, how did the world get here? Okay, God made it. How did God get here? When did he start? No, he, he is. No, no, but when did he start? No, he is. Um, he's not bound by time. There's not a time when he isn't. And and it's not just that that he's on the whole timeline, but he's outside of the timeline. He's he's at every moment of time, at every moment of time. Uh, so as he's making his promises, he's already seen their fulfillment, right? As he's creating the world, he he's seeing what we do to it and, and what he did to fix it. And so, I mean, that that complete picture that he has, whereas we only get to see what we see. Um, so yeah, God is eternal. God does not change. Adrian, you want Malachi 3? Malachi 3, 6. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Yeah, you descendants of Jacob, you believers, aren't destroyed. Uh, if God would change, um, we'd be in trouble. Uh, but because he is who he is and continues to be who he is, uh, we're not destroyed. Number four, he is almighty. The, the first passage there, he, he calls himself almighty. Um, I think this is one of those places, too, where we put God in a human box, where we try to co conceive of him through what we're used to. You know some people that are really powerful, right? That are really, really, really powerful. Uh, this isn't saying God is really, 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 really powerful. This is saying almighty. Um, there is absolutely no limit to his power. If you've ever had the thought, you know what, I don't want to bother God with this prayer request because he's busy, he's got other things on his mind. We're not understanding God's almighty nature. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that he is not powerful to accomplish without diminishing his power and ability to accomplish everything else. Um, Matthew 19, 26. Uh, LN, do you want to read that one? You want to play or pass? Uh, I'll, I'll read it. Excellent. Um, Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Thank you. So this was uh, Matthew 19. It says that a rich young ruler came up to Jesus and and uh, was kind of testing him and said, okay, so what do I have to do to be saved, Jesus? Uh, and, and Jesus said, well, what do you see in the Bible? Uh, and, and the guy's like, um, well, you got to keep the law. He's like, okay, have you kept the law perfectly? Um, you know, you know the commandments? Have you kept them all? And the guy's like, oh, yeah, I've kept all of those. Um, haven't had a problem with that at all. And Jesus says, oh, okay, well, then uh, go home sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. Um, and it says the man went away sad because he had great will. Notice what Jesus said, Don. He took the first commandment, put God first, and demonstrated, yeah, I haven't kept that one because my wealth is, is more important. And so then Jesus says to his disciples, you know, how hard it is for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's easier for a camel, which would have been the largest animal they would have seen on a day-to-day -day basis, to go through the eye of a needle, which the smallest opening they would have seen on a day-to-day -day basis. And uh, so then Peter speaks up and says, oh, so you're saying it's impossible. And that's what Jesus says, says this. Um, yeah, for man, absolutely impossible. But nothing impossible with God. God does the impossible. So he's almighty. Uh, any questions or comments? All right. Remember, if you're getting bored, it's because you're not asking good enough questions. So um, ask, ask those questions because I wouldn't want you to be bored. Uh, number five, God knows all. Psalm 139.4. Again, now you want that one? Yes. Before a word in, is on my tongue, you know it completely. Oh, Lord, God is everywhere. Okay, yeah, that's the getting into the next one. So, so yeah. Before words on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. Uh oh, right? You know, even the things I I didn't say, I stopped myself from saying. He still knows what 
what I was going to say. Um, that might be a little scary. At the same time, that's really comforting when you think about it. Um, in the house I grew up in, there were two floors and there's a steep step, a steep set of stairs going to the second floor where my room usually was um, with others. I had 30 brothers and sisters, so we were all upstairs except for the babies. Uh, but on the top of the flight of stairs, there was a picture of Jesus that uh, that hung there for as long as I can remember. And it was one of those pictures. It was a painting that had the white dots at 11 o'clock. You know what that does? It makes it look like wherever you are, his eyes are looking at you. And there were some days coming up the stairs where that was awesome, right? Yeah, Jesus is watching me. This is, this is great. But there were some days when I'm going up those stairs, you know, no, no, don't look at me, right? Um, because I know what I had done. And, and to think that he sees that, um, that can be scary. But you think about who it is, right? God the one who so loved the world that he was willing to sacrifice for us. God, the one who is almighty so he can fix any problem. He's the one who knows all. If you've ever had a friend that you knew something was wrong, but they wouldn't tell you what it was, it's frustrating, right? You can't do anything to help them. That's never a problem with God. So we don't have to try to hide something from him because he knows it all and he loves us even knowing it all. So yeah, he knows all. Uh, he is everywhere. Jeremiah 23, we're back around to uh, uh, Deborah, if you want it. Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, declares the Lord. Yeah, Adam and Eve sinned, and the first thing they tried to do was hide. Um, and of course, God knew where they were. Thankfully, right, to see those next next steps to to be able to give them that that promise um when we are living in a way we know we shouldn't be it's a temptation to try to hide from god too i don't want to think about that i don't want to pray i don't want to go to church um thankfully we can't hide from god he is everywhere Pat, i have a question please and i always ask myself this question adam mm -hmm. sin. god knows everything if he knew Adam and Eve was going to sin, why did he allow it to happen? All right. Awesome question. Yeah. Can I put a pin in that until lesson? Absolutely. I think it's lesson two because okay. that is, yeah, okay. that's exactly what we're going to talk about okay. next week. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, great question, which means that this is a good setup for next week. Now you got to come back. I got the answer to this question. Right? Um, <laughs> no, awesome question. Uh, and we will we will deal with it. Okay. Can I a question again? Oh, she said uh, uh, God knows everything, and He knew Adam and Eve were going to sin and all the problems that, that was going to cause. Why did He let it happen? Um, and I'm going to even take it the next step next week, and I'm going to ask you why did He put the tree in the garden and tell them not to eat from it? Thank you. Um, so okay. yeah, we'll, okay. we'll we'll get to that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> So, um, but in order to answer that, we got to know who God is. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, where were we? Holy, number seven, God is holy. Uh, Isaiah six, it's just the angels calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord almighty. Holy um, is not really, really, really good. Holy is absolutely good. Uh, absolutely no sin. You know, the, the absolute perfection. Um, I think that quite often we want to think that God is really, really, really good. God is holy. Uh, so God does not grade on the curve, right? You know, either to, to be, so holiness and sin don't mix. Either holiness destroys sin or sin destroys holiness. Adam and Eve sinned and instead of being holy, now they were sinners, right? Um, so if we want to be with God, holy is a scary thing. Because I know I'm not perfect, which will, in lesson two, we'll talk about, uh, um, it makes us realize we need what he has done, uh, that, that he makes us holy, and we'll talk about how he does that. Uh, so he's holy, he's faithful, uh, 2 Timothy 2.13, is that your turn, Sabrina? If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Okay. Um, 
we make promises and do our best to keep them, God cannot break a promise. He is faithful. If he says something, he does it. And if he doesn't, he's not God. And if he's not God, um, this whole thing falls apart and we aren't here. So, um, yeah, if, if there is a God and he is holy and perfect and trustworthy, he has to keep his promises. And there is a God, so God is faithful. Um, number nine, God is good, pretty straightforward, right? The Lord is good to all. Vicar, I'm going to have you read the longer one there. Um, number 10, God is compassionate and gracious, and at the same time, God is just. Uh, I, I think that a lot of times people accentuate one or the other of those to the exclusion of the other. So some people look at God. He is the loving, caring God. The, I call it the grandpa God. Um, mom and dad discipline the kids, right? Uh, is that true? Yeah. So, you know, don't always let you do what you want to do. And, you know, there, there's rules, whatever. Grandma and grandpa, oh, it's okay. I love you. I'm going to give you candy anyway, right? Um, a lot of people look at God that way. Oh, he just loves me so much that he doesn't really care what I do. It's all okay because he just loves me. Well, that's missing part of the picture. Um because God is also just, and he's serious about sin. But some people take that and highlight that, and they just look at God as this angry judge just waiting for me to mess up so he can punish me. Well, that's not who he is either. Um, in this passage, he puts the two side by side beautifully. Uh, Vicar, now I'm ready for you. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Okay. So that love, compassion, gracious, forgiving, and yet it punishes the guilty. Um, any questions on that one? Punishes the children for uh, many generations. Okay. That. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, I was hoping someone would would catch that because that doesn't sound fair, does it? Um, wait a second. How come the kids or the grandkids are getting punished because grandma and grandpa did something wrong? So we're gonna look at this two ways. First of all, look at the context of this passage, um, and that is Moses. Uh, well, God speaking to Moses to speak to the people as they are getting ready to go into the promised land. So they've been they've been separate in Egypt for 400 years because the Egyptians thought, thought shepherds were gross and they were the slaves. And so there wasn't really much interaction. The Egyptians didn't want to have anything to do with Israel. And God was about to make them a nation. He was about to make them powerful. And uh, uh, they all these other nations around them had their gods. And they were going to be living in an area surrounded by people who follow Molech or Baal or Asherah. Um, and, and in this section, God is telling them, be faithful. Uh, stay true to me. I'm, I'm your God. Those others aren't going to help you. Um, but think about this. If mom and dad get into the promised land and, and they say, oh, those people worshiping Molech, that looks kind of cool. Um, I think we'll start doing that. And they bring their kids along. What happens to the kids as they grow? That's what they learn, and that's what they do. And then what are they going to they train their kids in? Um, so the, the warning here is, you know, what we pass down matters. And if we're going to pass down rebelling against God, uh, not only will that be against us, but it'll be against everyone we teach to rebel against God. Um, the uh, uh, so that that's the looking at the it in context, um, and I mean we see that today, right? I mean there are certain sins that they talk about a generational curse, right? We pass things down, you know, uh, children that grow up in households where alcoholism is prevalent are. The stat I had seen was 84%, but there was a lady in the last class that, that teaches a DUI course, and she said that's 93% more likely to become alcoholic as they grow up. Um, people who grow up in a, in a household where there is where there is abuse are you know 87% more likely to be in an abusive relationship as they grow older. They don't have to be, 
but we learn from our environment. Um, and you know, so so there, there's that side of it. But then also, this is a great example of um, how nice it is that we have the whole Bible that God has given us this book. Because if there's, uh, you know, we look at a passage and we say, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. Um, let's look at where else in the Bible it talks about these things. So in Deuteronomy 5, God says almost the exact same thing um, where he describes himself as the compassionate and gracious God, uh, um, uh, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And he says almost the exact same thing on the flip side too, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished, but he punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. And then adds a phrase, of those who hate me. So, so it's it's not just that he's punishing the grandkids and the great grandkids, but it's the ones who continue to hate him, who continue to rebel. And and actually, uh, another place in the Bible, in Ezekiel 18, the people of Israel are complaining to the prophet Ezekiel, saying, uh, "This isn't fair. Uh, our life stinks because our grandparents messed up and rebelled, and and you know, so we got taken into exile, and 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 so our life stinks." And and God. Um, I'll actually read a section of that one. Um, let me find that. So this is Ezekiel 18. Ezekiel says, The word of the Lord came to me. What do you people mean by quoting this proverb about the land of Israel? The fathers eat sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. So you, so you understand that, that proverb, that saying that they're talking about? Our parents messed up. You know, they ate the sour grapes, and we're getting punished for it, right? As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, you will no longer quote this proverb in Israel. For every living soul belongs to me, the father as well as the son, both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. And, and through this chapter, he repeats that phrase several times. You know, the person who's rebelling against me, that's the one that gets the punishment for rebelling against me. And then he goes through and, and uh, tells a, a story. He says, suppose there's a righteous man. And then he, several verses describing this righteous man, he, he worships the Lord and he goes to the temple and he, uh, he does the right things. He doesn't worship the false gods. But then suppose that he has um, a violent son who sheds blood or does any of these other things, though the father has done none of them. He, he uh, um, uh, worships at the high places and he, you know, so all the things that he shouldn't do. And then it says, suppose that uh, his son, that, that he has a son, who sees the sins his father commits and doesn't follow them, but instead goes the way of the grandpa and worships the Lord and does the right things. He says, will, will this guy be rewarded because of his father? No, he'll be punished for his rebellion. And will this guy be punished because of his father? No, he'll be rewarded for his righteousness. Um, and then he says it again, the soul that sins is the one that will die. So, you know, very clearly uh, explaining, no, you're not just getting punished because... Grandma and grandpa did something, but because you've continued in it, you've continued to rebel. Does that help answer that one? What was the verse that you were... So right there was Ezekiel 18. Okay. Yep. And the the other one was Deuteronomy 5, verse 9, where he almost an exact quote with those that had it phrase. I have an Please. So false gods, I mm -hmm. guess, is my question. So if God is everything essentially god is everywhere then it wouldn't a false god an idol be god great question um yes. so god is everywhere uh, he does not say that he is everything um because we do see like next week we're going to be talking about uh the devil and the evil angels um that are not god right and there are passages that Passages that mm -hmm. talk about uh, the, the false gods are uh, often um, inspired by the demons, the ones that are trying to mislead people and, and turn them away from, from God. Um, so God has made everything. And, and this gets into Bridget's question, too. You know, why does he let bad things happen? Um, or why does, why does he allow sin to enter in the first place? Um, and I'm really struggling hard not to jump into that whole answer because if I do that, um, well, it'll help to have the, the background of the passages next week uh, to, to deal with that one. Um, but uh, uh, there are, there is evil, which is 
the absence of God, right? The the, the rebellion against God. And so uh, people are using things that God created to rebel, and he allows us to do that. And, and this is going to sound crazy. He allows us to do that because he loves us. Um, does it sound crazy? Okay. Um, we'll, we'll dig into that more uh, next week, too. But uh, he wants us to have a relationship with him. He created us for a relationship with him. Uh, in order to have that relationship, he doesn't want it to be a relationship of slave. He doesn't want it to be a relationship of, of you know, a robot that's been programmed that can only do one thing. Um, when, so I'll tell a story uh, that I usually tell next week, but I think it'll help answer this one. Um, just because I think it's a really good story and I like talking about my son when he was in kindergarten. So my son's now 25 years old. Uh, when he was in kindergarten, uh, we lived in a split foyer house and the lower level, this was before we had the building, before we had the land or the property, the lower level I used as the church office. Um, and so I was in my office. Uh, he came in through the garage from kindergarten, got off the bus, um, came in through the garage, came into that, that door on the lower level and saw me working in my office. So two scenarios. Scenario one, uh, he sees me, he comes in, throws his arms around me, says, I love you, Dad, give me a big hug. Um, scenario two, he sees me, I see him, I tell him, Andrew, you better get in here right now, give me a hug, tell me you love me, otherwise, I'm you know, taking away all your toys, you're not going to have any dinner, and you're going to bed right now. So then he comes in, gives me a hug, and tells me he loves me. Um, which is better? The, the first one, right? He had the option to just go upstairs and ignore me. But he didn't. He chose to come in there and give me a hug and, and express his love. Um, that was relationship, right? The other is not. Um, God, God allows there to be the negative, the evil, the devil, um, so that we always have a chance to love him, to to. Uh, choose that relationship. Does that help any? Kind of, but okay. all other gods aren't necessarily like evil, right? I mean, like you were saying before, a lot of the different religions, they have the same concepts that we have, and so their gods are asking them to perform the same things that our god is. Okay. So are those the devil, or are those demons, or are there false gods necessarily oh. that? Or is it just their way of expressing God? Right. So it, it's, it's their way of expressing what they think God is. Ultimately, every other religion than Christianity um, has 180 degree difference in, in this one thing. Yes, there are laws, right? Do this, don't do that. Every other religion, do this, don't do that, so that you can get on God's good side, right? So that you can appease God so that he will be good to you. Christianity says um, you haven't been perfect. God did this, right? Jesus lived the perfect life and, and paid the price that, that we deserve. You know, you think of the, the false gods back in the day and the sacrifices were, um, you know, your burning offerings or, or even some, you know, child sacrifices or, or things like that today. Uh, you don't see so much of that anymore, but uh, but you do see sacrifices of of time and doing things and and all of that. Now you say, but in Christianity, you know, the, the Jews offered animal sacrifices just like people around them, and today people do a whole lot of volunteering and serving the church. Um, but the why is the difference? Is it to in order to please God so that He'll be good to be, good to me, or is it out of thanks for what He has already done for me? So that's the, the, the Christianity. And so um, the there are a lot of really nice people that follow different religions. Um, if God is who he says he is, and he says that 
um, that he does want us to, to worship him alone and that not worshiping him is worshiping something else, right? Um, and well, if God is who he says he is and I'm saying he's something else, um, you know, how do you, how do you like that if someone is talking trash about you and it's not true? Or even even describing you as something that you're not, right? Um, the, those worshiping a false god aren't doing it on purpose. Some of them are. Some of them say, I don't like that god, I'm going to, you know, make it my own or whatever. But many individuals are saying, this seems right. Um, and this question is going to come up a few times is, okay, what about them? They're trying their hardest. Um, what about me? I'm trying my hardest. All of us eventually have to come to the understanding that God is holy. And trying my hardest doesn't cut it. I need what he has done. Right? You know, the, the passages that talk about uh, um, only through Jesus, only through the, the forgiveness of sins that he gives to us, uh, do we have that relationship with him. Otherwise, we're relying on our own uh, our own merits and it's not enough and that sounds that might sound um, harsh or judgmental or whatever else but we do need to be real uh, do I have what it takes to be right with God um, and yeah again a lot of this is is less than two stuff uh, so can we uh yeah. You get to, yeah yeah so thank you very much great questions uh and it's stuff that does need to be answered and i want to i want to give it it's it's just time to dig into it well because we've got three minutes left yeah. um so so yeah god's compassion gracious god is just let's do number 11 i forget whose turn it is when i start answering questions i absolutely forget whose turn it is to read so who's up all right um, John 4, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Yeah, God is love. We feel love, and we show love, but God is love. Everything he does, everything about him is love. And one of the things that will come up again and again, I already hinted at it before, whenever we ask a question, why did God let this happen, or why did God do that, um, the answer is always because he loves us, because that's who he is. Um, and we'll we'll see that coming out more later. And I, I won't start the Trinity um, right now. We'll, we'll pick that up next time, just because we're two minutes left for your last <laughs> questions or comments, thoughts on, on the who is God lesson. Well, I have a, uh, just a comment on the, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Shelby. Shelby. Um, on your your comment about the the God and um, the idols mm -hmm. that they use as a God, in my opinion, and a, a little more than my opinion, their idol, what they representing as their God, that, that those are man made. They made them and saying, "This is my God, and this is what this is what I'm going to mm -hmm. worship," and and they're believing that if they do that, that's going to bring them what they want. And on the other hand, our God is is nobody made him; he just is. Okay. Yeah. And that's and that's the, because of the holy, the, the, because of the Trinity, the, the Spirit, um, Jesus. And, you know, they're all they're all that one. Yeah. Encompassing yeah. everything. Yeah. Maybe I'm not explaining this right. No, I, th I think that, but, that um, that's great. Yeah, it, there's there's definitely a difference, and I think. As we go, um, hopefully, God's word will shed more and more light on it and and help to answer it. Because tonight we brought up some huge questions, um, which is awesome. Uh, so let's let's stick together and and keep digging to get some some more complete answers to those questions. Sound like a plan? Okay. All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for giving us this time in your word and for this wonderful group of people with uh, with awesome questions that, that will guide us as we um, seek to find answers from you. 
open our hearts, open our eyes, open our minds to um, see your love in everything. And bring us back safely next week to, to keep digging. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Right? Yeah. See you again, I'll see you all again. Bye-bye. Enjoyed it. Bye. Bye. <laughs>